Welcome. It's time for the further adventures of Indiana Jones. The greatest adventures of all time. I don't know, I'm making this up as I go. Pack your bag, grab your passport, and prepare to go globetrotting with Marvel Comics' classic four-color adventures of Indiana Jones. Jones? Jones! Mr. Jones, I've heard a lot about you, sir. Your appearance is exactly the way I imagined. Ha 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 I'm here now. What do you want to talk about? Welcome, IndieCast listeners, to the further adventures of Indiana Jones. I'm Joe Stuber. And I'm Keith Voss. Hey, Joe, in our last segment, we got a chance to talk with the illustrator for issues four and five, Mr. Ron Friend. That's right. We're going to continue that discussion uh, this segment. A uh, lot of uh, lot of good information came out of that last one. We got a peek behind the scenes. We talked about uh, some of the, the coloring mishaps. <laughs> Yes, uh, that, that went on, and uh, and this so crazy. yeah, in this segment we're going to talk a little bit about the humor uh, that was uh, so apparent in Raiders of the Lost Ark that uh, they were able, uh, David Michelinie, the writer, and Ron Friends were able to bring into the series as well. Yeah, it all worked really well, and very good, uh, very good feeling for the comic too. It wasn't forced; it was all part of the story, well placed. Um, I loved it. Yeah, and I think as you mentioned in the last segment too, very Raiders esque. Yes. Uh, as it went in, so uh, we you know really enjoyed uh, these issues. So why don't we head into Club Obi Wan to finish up that chat? Uh, what do you say? Should I order uh, a round of uh, flaming pigeons for the table? Yeah, okay, that's fine. But uh, I think I would rather it get to my stomach the old fashioned way. No, no, no more throwing of the skewers, please. No throwing skewers. <laughs> Let's head into the club <laughs> and finish our chat with Ron. Friends, there are the pigeons now. Now you mentioned some of the gags. I, we Keith and I had talked about that. Um, a lot of a lot of humor throughout the book. A lot of those different double takes and some of those pan. We talked about the train and different things like that, and the uh, stealing the the Rolls Royce from the the British couple and things like that. Mm-hmm. How tough is that to make sight gags into a comic book? How how because the pacing in a comic book is completely different. You can get away with a lot in film. How difficult is that for you to sort of get those jokes across? Because every one of them they they work. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, dev- I never found it all that difficult because, you know, the long history of cartooning is that, that you know, doing those kinds of sight gags, I mean, the, you look at your Sunday newspaper, that's what it is. It's, it's sequential art being used to do sight gags and, and, uh, and double takes and spit takes and all that kind of stuff. I've always had a different, I, I remember one time being at Marvel and they were doing an, assist, uh, an assistant editor's class where they were, Having you know the part of the assistant editor's duties any at any point during the week would be to be part of these meetings where uh, speakers would uh, would come up and talk to them about the nuts and bolts of editing. And I remember I was in town one time, and I just happened to be in town for one of these assistant editors things. I sat in on it with uh, with Mark Grunwald, God rest his soul. I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, we were talking about uh, you know. Uh, as as it as it uh, as it applies to editing, uh, you know, what things can be done in writing and what things can't, and we got into a discussion of like whether or not you can do sarcasm in copy, you know, in in dialogue in a comic book, whether or not you can carry off sarcasm and everything, and and I think if a if, if the writer and the penciler are on the same page, no pun intended, no pun intended, no, <laughs> but if if they're if they are, it, you know. No pun intended. If they're on the same page, it, it should be possible to do anything in a comic book. You know, certainly there are limitations, but it should be possible to do anything in a comic book you could do on a on a television show or on a movie screen, if it's something that's done visually. So if you have, you know, again that that teamwork where you have the dialogue coming out of the character, but the character is rolling their eyes or smirking or has the head cocked in a certain way, you should be able to show sarcasm i mean i couldn't give you an example but i'd be shocked if you look through the stuff that i've done with tom falco and haven't seen sarcasm at some point <laughs> you know from coming from one of the characters you know that kind of thing so i i do believe any kind of side gag can be done it may require a couple of extra cuts or a couple of extra panels or something but i mean you know 
Dave is a very funny guy, and uh, you know, I'm sure he had a lot of the humor in the plot because that was part of the Indiana Jones experience. You know, I mean, you, again, at that time, all we had was the first movie to go by, but certainly, Indy's humor and sarcasm and one-liners were a huge part of people's enjoyment of that film. So he put a lot of it in there, and I love that kind of stuff. When it comes to things like the uh, taking the limousine from the rich people. That was something that was all added by David in the scripting stage. I mean, especially the bit with the, uh, you know, Hush Meddings, the man said the service was free, you know, that kind of thing. That was just Dave sitting at his typewriter, uh, amusing the hell out of himself and coming up with some wonderful lines, you know. Because a lot it's, of it. That's uh, with it, too, so. It's a great moment because we can, I mean, even when I'm reading it, I can hear the John Williams <clears throat> music playing in behind it, just something, you know, lighthearted as they're, as they're kind of going away. The, the books themselves are very Raiders esque, as we talked about, right from the very beginning. The cover, uh, especially on four, is amazing. You've got. It's entirely action-packed. You've got Indy with the whip, the train bearing down on them, the evil Nazis, the damsel in distress, all these things. What direction did you get uh, in putting the covers together? Uh, well, every any time you do a cover with Marvel, and the process hasn't really changed too much. You usually turn in a couple of different sketches uh, as loose as you can get away with and still communicate what's supposed to be on them. You send them into editorial, and the editors, you know, uh, they they kind of huddle around it and they decide what they want to do and they'll either either give you a phone call or send you uh, 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 a, a sketch that's got notes on it or something. But you know, usually that's uh, always uh, a large um, a huddle with the editorial end of it. And I mean, to this day, when you turn, you know, I'll I'll sometimes turn in like six different ideas for a cover, and. Sometimes it's just a matter of them picking one. Sometimes it's say, can you take this element from, from one and mix it with this element from another one and kind of combine those two because we want to get that in there. Um, and I'm sure that was pretty much the process. You know, I mean, the fact that I had the plots in front of me, I was able to, you know, uh, utilize elements from, from uh, further into the story and things like that. But I, I don't remember them coming to me with a, a sketch prepared by anybody else or even – dictating what exactly they thought the cover should be necessarily. Sometimes you'll have a brief conversation where they'll say, you know, we think the, the scene on the on the subway tracks would be the best shot or anything like that, you know. Uh, you're also that's credited, possible. Um, you're credited alongside with uh, Michael Gustavich on the cover. Um, what did he add to it? Uh, well, he, he inked it. Uh, the, the covers at the time probably, I think the second one, I actually did more layouts and breakdowns for. Yeah, you soloed the on the second one. one. On the first one, I, I, I did full pencils. Um, Gustavich has a very distinctive style, so I could see that he that he had quite a bit to it. I mean, at this point, almost 30 years later, I'd have to see a Xerox of my pencils to really, you know, right. go through it page by uh, point by point. But um, you know, it's you know, it's a pretty straightforward cover. I mean, he certainly added some nice inking detail to the barrels on the guns and all that kind of stuff, and. Uh, and carried it off. I mean, the the coloring, nothing against the colorist, but it, it, the coloring's kind of all over the board on that one with the, the you know, the colors on Karen and not yeah. really picking up the lighting as, far as, as uh, you know, with the, not really picking up the, the lighting from the train coming at them as, as part yeah, of what was going yeah. on. Exactly. But, and this uh, is also, this is also the first issue that featured the, the box that said featuring the hero of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, um, did you have anything to do with that? Was that something no. that no, nothing? No, it is, it is something. It is something I smiled when I noticed last night, though, because you know we live in a world now where there are four Indiana Jones movies, and everybody knows who Indiana Jones is, and and they used Indiana Jones in the title of the later <laughs> movies. <laughs> but um, you know, you never would need a uh, a, a piece like that at the time. But obviously, somebody in editorial thought, you know, maybe that's. Maybe you know, maybe the sales weren't what they were hoping they were yeah, going to be, or was, something. And they decided, that's well, let's a selling point. Hey, Raiders of the Lost Ark, huge hit. At this right. Point. Um, we need but, we need to let people know as as clearly exactly. as possible that this is that character. Was that your idea to sneak the Spielberg reference in on the opening? Yes. Spot? Yeah, that was just me being a little fan geek. Um, for those that for those listening that don't have the comic in front of them, what's what is that sly little reference you threw in there? Uh, it was CE three K. It was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It was the uh, and and it was one of those things where you know, uh, along with Star Wars and references and all that kind of jazz, you kind of uh, 
you know, it was a Spielberg nod that I uh, just threw in on the side of the plane that the anchor apparently got and carried through and all that kind of jazz. So it was, you know, in fact, let me see if I look at it real. Yeah, that would have been the anchor that that carried it through. Because sometimes, you know, if an editor sees it, they'll even have the letterer carry it through. But that looks pretty much like it was a part of the artwork. So I would assume Danny got the joke and and kept it on there and stuff. And quite often you do that kind of thing and. And uh, if the anchor or the editor doesn't get it, it might not make it through to the final comic. But in that case, I think it was obvious enough that uh, that they all smiled and let it go through. Were you inspired so by was, uh, uh, Raiders' was, opening sequence, the uh, OBCPO on the plane? I was not inspired by anything, I don't think. I, I'm not even sure at the time I ever caught that bad reference on the plane, to tell you the truth. But, uh, because I was, you know, I don't, I couldn't even tell you how many times I had seen the movie. I know I saw it multiple times in the theater, and I, I, I tend to buy, you know, when you see these magazines that have nice stills from it and shots from it and everything, I will buy those up, and I'm sure that I had those myself when I was working on, on the actual issue. You referenced. I mean, I could actually, I could actually tell a couple of times as I was looking at it in the pencils which shots I was using for reference. There's, there's a couple of uh, profile shots of Indy that I'm sure were often the same piece of reference uh, from from my part of it. Um, you know, Danny. I don't know what what Danny would have had in front of him as far as reference and how he was going with it, or if he used reference at all. He might have just been working off of uh, off a of memory because. Different people have different philosophies about that because sometimes if you try to make it look too much like a portrait, it doesn't feel like a natural part of the rest of the artwork. So you kind of have to, to find the middle ground on that. I mean, by the time I came on to Star Wars, Tom Palmer had already pretty much decided how he was handling all the characters. You know, he had it down in his head. You know the best way to to make Luke look like Luke, and the best way to make uh, 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 Lando look like Lando. And at one point, I I had done a cover where I did full pencils on the cover, and I did Lando. I, I pulled reference on Billy D. Williams, and I I thought I had really nailed Billy D. Williams' face and everything, but it wasn't in a way that was the way Tom had been doing it up to that point. So he did his. Tom Lando over it, and it was his book. You know, it was one of those things where I kind of went, well, that didn't really make through the way I was hoping it was going to, but uh, he knows what he's doing, so there you go. I mean, so if I would have taken a lot of reference and done, you know, every shot of Luke looking like a portrait of uh, Mark Hamill, chances are Tom would have gone through, and at that point, the book had established what Luke looked like. He would have gone ahead and done his Luke over anything I would have tried. And fair is fair, you know, so when I was doing breakdowns, I wasn't as concerned with that kind of stuff. That wasn't that wasn't the part of the job that it, that was my part of the job. You know, that was Tom's part of the job. A lot of different vehicles in this adventure, a lot of different environments. Uh, you personally, what do you like to draw? Action, emotion, technology, vehicle? What, what are some of the things that well, you enjoy? Well, as I said early on, I, I love telling the story. So I, I am not one of those artists that... Artist. I, I never call myself that either. I'm not an illustrator that, if because there are writers who will ask you, you know, what what do you what are you into? What do you like to draw? And I've always, <laughs> I've always kind of smirked at that question because I I don't have something like that. If you know, if you ask me, if a writer completely sincerely said, what would you like to do? I, tell a story, man. Just t- t- you tell you tell me. You're the writer. Tell me a story. And make it interesting. You know, give me characters that I can latch on to and give me something interesting to do. <clears throat> but I, I would never give an answer like, I like to draw jungles or I like to draw dinosaurs or I want to draw tech. Just draw a lot of tech, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, certainly if you keep it fantastic, then it's easier to do because you're not, you don't have to go as reference heavy. So. No. You know, you know, if if you say I want it to be a fantasy castle uh, and I want it to be an adventure in Ron's head, so I don't have to look at reference for anything, you know, um, that would be silly. So yeah, again, this job being you know, pre-internet, um, I'm sure I wasn't just hitting Google Images for any of that stuff. So I, I uh, probably went to the library or went to a bookstore and and uh, bought a couple of books on the era and. Uh, 
you know, uh, obviously had reference for the, the limousine and, and for some of the, the, you know, the more obvious things. Uh, and I, I think I, I think there's a couple of shots of the train station. I think I just faked the crap out of that. But um, what about Karen Mee's hairstyle? That I was definitely trying to go with something. Period. Um, and on some shots it comes through, on others not so much. But but yeah, I was definitely trying to give the leading lady something that would that would scream because she's wearing like a British tweed jacket too and everything. And I was definitely trying to put her in place. And I want I also wanted the lead Nazi to be distinctive. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the no eyebrows, brow, and the, the, the square head and all that kind of jazz. But, uh, yeah, so I, w- I was definitely trying. I can look at it and see that I was definitely trying to, to match a period and, and keep the main characters. You know, I, I noticed <laughs> that the, uh, the scientist that introduces Indy to Karen uh, it just looks like Arthur Treacher's or something. <laughs> you know, we're in Britain, so somebody's got to have that stupid mustache. Yeah, have you know, a pipe got... and you know the the handlebar mustache. Absolutely. Yeah, British guy one hundred and one. You know that kind of thing. So I, I noticed that and smiled at that. The one thing that, that's interesting to me is I'm almost sure, as I was looking through it again, this is the genius of Dave Michelinie at work, is that he had Smitty show up again. And the pilot from the original, from the first sequence, and he had he was mentioning another uh, second in command Nazi named Nebel through the whole thing. And I'm pretty sure I- I'm not even positive that when I penciled the scene in the train car that I knew that that was supposed to be the pilot from the original sequence. If you if you understand uh-huh. what I'm saying, yeah, I think they were all just faceless Nazi agents through the whole thing, and it was Dave who connected them all and made them characters, which I think is. Wonderful. I mean, that's when you are handing when you're handing the baton back and forth between plot and full script. That is something that's magic that can happen, and Dave really made it work. You know. Speaking of connecting things, uh, in this two issue story arc, Gateway to Infinity, uh, you got to preview. Uh, you got to do a little preview of both uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom with a rope bridge, and Last Crusade with a motorcycle and sidecar with Indy and Karen escaping from the train. And uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull with uh, with a quicksand uh, little qu- quicksand bit. Did that yeah. occur to you while you were watching the prequel and the sequels? Did you say, "Hey, we did that in our book first? No, it really didn't because those those two issues have kind of faded into obscurity in my bad memory. But um, <laughs> the one thing I will say is that and that is a problem we would cu- we would hit up hit up against all the time when we were on Star Wars. Spielberg and Lucas should hire Dave Michelinie right now, as far as I'm concerned. Because when Dave was working on Star Wars, he came up with the idea of them building a second Death Star. Okay, one blew up. Why wouldn't they build a second one? And Lucasfilm went, you can't do that. <laughs> and they went, why not? And he went, you can't do that. All right? And they went, okay. So pretty early on, Dave was walking around going, I think you can expect to see a second Death Star in uh, one of the movies coming up. You know, that kind of thing. So, and again, as you point out, I mean, there's these bits. I mean, a lot of them, you know, not to give us all too much credit, a lot of them are staples of the uh, the cliffhanger serials that it, that uh, the Indiana Jones series is based on. You know, so right. so it's it's not like uh, that's an idea that comes whole cloth out of somebody's gourd. That's something you've seen in a serial at some point before. You know, but uh, yeah, I, I I did notice that when I was rereading them in preparation for this. Uh, you know, for this uh, interview, and and again on Star Wars, it would happen to us all the time. We we created little furry creatures that lived in the forest, <laughs> and at one point they said they have to look more like kitty cats than teddy bears. And I went, that's ridiculous. Why why did they need to look more like kitty cats? And they went, shut up. They just have to look more like kitty cats than teddy bears. Okay, and we went, all right. But you so were we went. Any- you weren't given any of that uh, instruction on Indiana Jones, were you? They just like, whatever you did. Yeah, at that point, with one movie out and uh, not knowing whether or not there were going to be sequels or that it was intended to be in any way a series, they didn't have those kind of limitations on us. We weren't gotcha. we weren't getting arbitrarily uh, told that we couldn't do things just because. But you know, certainly uh, with, with Lucas on Star Wars, it was a slightly different situation. You obviously had likeness rights uh, on on this uh, series because your Harrison Ford likeness is is spot on. It's immediately recognizable. Yet. You're able to bring some of yourself into it. What's the thought process that goes into this of, of penciling such a familiar face? Well, for me, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, it's almost more a matter of physics. 
I mean, you're not going to do Indy with a square jaw looking like Captain America or Steve Rogers because Harrison Ford isn't that kind of ruggedly handsome, you know. So uh, for me, it's mostly just like the length of the nose type stuff, the length of the face type stuff, where the eyes sit on the nose and things like that. Um, and again, Danny Bolinati, a lot of what you're seeing as, as the finished illustration is Danny Bolinati bringing him his own uh, style, and he has a very distinctive style to everything. So I would have to give Danny, uh, as far as the likenesses that you're noticing and the things that you're appreciating, I'd have to, you know, to hand that one over to Danny. But, uh, uh, I mean, I did have some reference in front of me to make sure that the proportions were there and that, it, you know, that there was no danger of it looking more like, uh, you know, a more square-jawed type of a hero or something. I mean, I did have indie reference in front of me. The thing that's weird is those two issues that I did back in 83, I still get people coming up to me at conventions asking for me to do a shot of Indiana Jones. And I, if you look on the web, if you go to Comic Guard fans, I think there's a few of them up there, at least one of them up there. The most recent one I've done I know is up there. And it's always, you know, I always do a shot of him with the whip and all that kind of jazz. But... um it was a, you know, it was a lot of fun. I remember before I was hired to do that, I had a couple of sketches of Indiana Jones working off a of reference in my sketchbook at the time. Uh, before I was working professionally, I would, you know, do full color shots uh, in this, uh, you know, wiring the sketchbook, uh, big size sketchbook. And I remember one of the ones I did with, uh, you know, colored in markers and stuff was a shot of Indy with his whip, and uh, in and. It always seemed very natural for me because I always loved the way this gentleman handled uh, fabric and everything, and it always took it more into a realistic realm for me. Was if I mean, it's something that a regular fan might not notice, but if I mention it, maybe you'll be able to look at it and see it. I, is I was kind of channeling a little bit of Gene Colan when I was working on the uh, the layouts for for that those two Indiana Jones issues, because one, Colan always kind of took comics art and took it more towards the photographic. And two, I always loved the way he could have people in regular clothes moving around, and, and yet they had a wonderful fluidity to them and movement to them and all that. And uh, I was really, it, it probably doesn't come through too much, because I'm not sure I did, I certainly didn't do Gene Colan justice in the jobs. I'm not trying to say that. But there, you know, if you look at the cover to five, there's some Colan and the gesturing and the hands and all that kind of stuff. And if you look at the end of five, when uh, Indy jumps off the rock at Stonehenge and takes out the Nazi, there is some there, there's some colon to the uh, the attitude of the figures and uh, the leaping shot and all that. That's what I was going for, and uh, and even the use of uh, the motion lines and everything. I was trying to be a little more loosey goosey with the motion lines, the way Gene Colan always was, and I, and I was thinking colon while I was laying out the two issues. I, like I said, it's up to the viewer as to how much of it actually made it through. No, I got a sense of that, too, just even looking at him. Just very 60s Marvel. Uh, it was very, very much a throwback to it. Uh, Keith, it looks like I missed an opportunity when I was at uh, Mid-Ohio Con. I could have had Ron Friends do a, a, an Indiana Jones original. Uh, okay. Oh, I never. I, I try never to turn anybody down. I mean, certainly you're not going to get much of a likeness one time. I'll ask somebody, next time. Well, one time when somebody asked me for one, I, ha I, pulled a, I, had a, I happened to have a comic book in my... Uh, uh, my case, and I pulled it out because I knew it was it was a it wasn't a comic book; it was a magazine, and I knew that it had an ad in it for one of these uh, statues that had a wonderful likeness of uh, Harrison Ford is, uh, on an indie statue. And I was able to open to that ad and use that for reference for the face and the hat and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, you know, I know I remember enough about how indie's equipment is draped on them and all that kind of stuff that I could it usually... All looks great. It all looks great. Uh, wow, well, thank you. I can usually, in a convention, I can usually pull off a shot of, uh, you know, Indy with the whip or something like that and get the costume detail close enough and all that kind of jazz. Uh, like I said, if you get a chance when when we're done here, you go on Comic Art Fans, and I'm pretty sure there's, the most recent one I've done, I'm pretty sure is up there somewhere, and you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. Would you like another crack at Indiana Jones? I, if somebody offered me Indiana, if I got a if I got a call from Dark Horse and said, "Listen, we're trying to contact all the old parts that worked on the Marvel series, uh, would you be interested?" I would say, "I would say yes, sir. Please, may I have another?" I mean, I, <laughs> I am I'm a freelancer right now. I'm not on. 
uh, a regular series. I've actually I've been talking uh, to IDW Publishing, and I'm going to be doing some uh, GI Joe work for them. I worked on an annual, the GI Joe annual that'll be out in February, and uh, there's there's a promise of some more uh, GI Joe work to come. And uh, yeah, they're doing some great licensed stuff right now. Right now. Well, and I'm working on uh, Real American Hero with Larry Hama, apparently, uh, is the annual that I worked on. So it's the continuation of the old Marvel series. This annual that we worked on that will be out uh, beginning of next year, uh, I'm penciling a third of it, uh, and Ron Wagner is doing some of it, and Herb Trimpey is doing some of it, all to be inked by Sal Pesama. Nice. So it will be like a Marvel old home week on G.I. Joe, you know. So. What would you do with Indy right now in 2011? What would I do with him? Um Indie blue, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I think <laughs> we've done some indie pink. powers, some electrical powers that come from a symbiotic uh, costume. It that, wouldn't be strange uh, the ending of Crystal Skull, that's for sure. I would take the whip and I would give it to this everyman architect, and uh, <laughs> and then he would carry on the tradition of Indiana Jones in the modern world, uh, but not talk the way Indy did. You know, that's a, <laughs> so that's a Thunderstrike reference for people that. Uh, don't care, but anyway, um, I, I, you know, I think the character. St- I, I, I don't. What, what did you guys think of uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? I loved it. We like it. I mean, oh, thank, thank God. We, we. Uh, you were our first uh, interview that liked Crystal Skull. Thank you. Really? Keith, there, there we go. <laughs> oh man, no. I mean, one of the things one. I loved about it was that they let the character. You know, they didn't try to ignore the fact that the character had aged. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sold on the Mutt character yet. I mean, if they. If they decide they want to go ahead and make a series of movies with Mutt, I, you know, I haven't bought my ticket for that yet. They're, yeah, bring, they're bringing in the youngins. They're bringing in the youngins with that. I want to keep it indie, exactly. Yeah, but as a, as a sidekick in that movie, I didn't mind him at all. But I'll tell you the stuff I really enjoyed were those moments where the characters were talking about what Indy had done since between. the 30s. Yeah. You know, like his career in the military and all that kind of jazz. I, I just love those kinds of moments where yeah, you got caught that's... up. Up. I with, ate with, stuff up. For that reason, I thought Crystal Skull, just because it was checking in with his character after this, you know, huge period of time, and they, you know, moving it into the into the fifties and everything, the early fifties. I, I just, I thought it played well. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, maybe because I'm I, older now myself or something. What's what time period would you like to set Indian? If you, if Dark Horse called uh, tomorrow and said, "Hey, we want to take a crack at an indie book," what are your thoughts? I, I think I'd probably rather do a more vital indie. You know, I'd probably uh, I'd probably be game to. And I'm not a writer myself, but I, I would probably be game to do something along the lines of Crystal Skull or not Crystal Skull. I'm sorry, uh, Temple of Doom, where you know it's a more vital indie. Uh, you know, because I was always a big Doc Savage fan. So those scenes of him <laughs> where he got into shape and his shirts all torn and all that kind of stuff. I thought that stuff was really cool, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I would want Indy at his peak. Um, you know, probably, you know, I mean, at this point, so much uh, comic material and novel material has been done about Indy that I'm sure they've touched on just about everything. But I, what I liked about Temple of Doom was that it went a different direction. It, it took you into... Uh, atmospheres and areas and uh, scenario that you didn't see Indy in before, and for that reason, I thought it was very valid and worth doing. You know, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, pair me with you know, if if Tom DeFalco and I could come up with an idea where we take Indy to a place we've never seen him before, I think that would be really fascinating. So, you mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned GI Joe. What are some other things that are on uh, your drawing table right now? Well, actually, the stuff that's coming out. <clears throat> More importantly, on the racks is uh, Jughead uh, Double Digest material that Tom DeFalco and I did for Archie Comics. Uh, the latest issue, 175, that's on the stands right now, and 176, which will be out next month. And uh, then uh, another the, Jones. Yeah, another Jones. There you go, Jones. <laughs> um, but he's, uh, and then the last one will be out, I believe, in February. Where were three uh, 22-page stories that uh, DeFalco and I collaborated on for Jughead, which was a, I, an incredible amount of fun. And I'm currently finishing up a uh, uh, one-shot for Marvel that's going to be part of a, a five-issue miniseries called Hulk Smash Avengers that is going to track the relationship of the Hulk and the Avengers over the history of the Marvel Universe. Very timely. Very timely. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that will probably it'll be out 
beginning of next year, and it'll probably be out in trade by the time the movie comes out next year. You know, that fever, kind of thing. A fever pitch, and you're going to be making headlines again probably with that one. Well, there you go. But that, that's the stuff I'm working on right now. I have you haven't changed the purple pants, have you? Oh, the issue I'm doing is uh, we're doing the first issue together, so we're going to be doing the classic Avengers versus the classic Hulk in the purple pants when he was a little more thuggish when he was... Uh, Don't change his costume. Little... Uh, no, no, I don't change. I... Oh, will you guys get off it? I'm telling you, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> Hulk smash. Well, how can uh, how can fans learn more about you? I don't. I, I know you don't have an email. You mentioned me. You don't have an email address. So, um, well, uh, I, I I'm part of if you if you uh, the thing the places I check in on. Uh, let's see there. When I do have my laptop uh, hooked up to some Wi-Fi, I check the Spider Girl message board. Which there's not much going on there anymore. But when Spider Girl was in full force, we used uh, Tom and I would interact with our fans there. Um, and I, I am part of a, uh, a website called CatskillComics.com, run by a gentleman named Scott Cress, who, uh, you know, I, I, I will take commissions through there, will sell some of the uh, original artwork and stuff, and, uh, you know, I interact there. But I go to conventions and shake hands with people and get a cold. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm available, you know. I mean, plus the fact, I, I think people out on the Internet enjoy talking about people more than they enjoy talking to people, to tell you the <laughs> truth. And unfortunately, I, you know, I, I find out about things that people are talking about, and sometimes it, sometimes it really hurts my feelings, guys. <laughs> well, we, well, we can say nicer. we can say we enjoy talking to you today. Uh, that was you uh, could say that, but we, will we, you actually say? It? I will That's go on record as actually having said we enjoy talking to you and <laughs> enjoyed meeting you uh, again. We had, uh, caught up with you a few years back and uh, enjoyed meeting you at Mid Ohio Con as well. Um, getting my books personalized. I'm sure Keith enjoys his original Ron Friends artwork as well. That is, uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, what a Thanks resume so you've got. And uh, just breathing life into those uh, those further adventures between you and David Michelini. I know there were two fill-in issues, but uh, fantastic job. Well, you know, and so was Spider-Man 252. So you got to keep that in mind as well. But, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you guys for the offer. Uh, it, was, it was a great deal of fun to... Uh, I, I actually had to go out to a comic shop and find the issues. They're only three bucks if you can find them in a back issue bin. And uh, I did pick up the omnibus and flip through it that you were telling me about, Joe. So I, I, I did uh, looks, experience that. The omnibus looks great, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I I really enjoyed flipping through it. I ended up just by paying for the two books, and uh, but uh, reread them last night because I couldn't find my copies. But you know, it was it was fun going back and talking about something that I did well like 28 years ago. Uh, it makes me feel old, but that's okay. That's my problem, not your problem. Well, it's it, was a, it. it was a great pleasure. You guys are a class act, and uh, thanks for having me over here at the club. Thank well, you so thank much. You so and much. It, you, you've reached a new generation of, of fans with these with these adventures, so uh, we're, we're enjoying them. And thank you so much for everything you've done. I appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Well, there you have it, further fans, another legendary member of the Marvel bullpen, Ron Friends. We really appreciate him uh, taking the time uh, to stop by and chat with us about the further adventures of Indiana Jones. Yeah, he was a lot of fun to interview. He's a very lively guy. Yeah, he had a lot to say. Um, you know, some of it uh, didn't make it everything into the interview. We talked to him for, uh, for a good long while. He went into detail about Spider-Man and Superman. Hopefully, we could get that out. Somehow. Yeah, we're going to work on. Uh, I think we're going to work with Mitch a little bit to see if we can, uh, f- you know, find a, another outlet for that too. So hopefully, uh, in, in a future podcast, uh, we'll be able to check that out as well. One thing I really appreciated was uh, how he brought to life the dynamic between writer and illustrator. I think that was uh, something Absolutely. really we got to see a peek behind the curtain because just going from initial plot to pencils. Back to full script, we really saw how that that came to life and how, man, it made just a a fantastic adventure filled with cliffhanger uh, elements, and it really brought that Indiana Jones tale to life. Absolutely. It is comparable to Raiders of the Lost Ark. It really is. Um, With the MacGuffin, like you said, the way they brought the humor to to, to the story, it is a fantastic story. Absolutely. Um, I also have a new appreciation for that artwork, knowing that the late, great Gene Colan was acknowledged. Oh, how was that? I mean, that was – what, what a nice touch. I mean, you kind of – you, you can see it, but just to hear the the person who did the pencils be able to say, yeah, I was trying to channel <laughs> Gene in a – Hey, what do you say we check the mailbox? Mister, get your arm out of that mailbox. I mean now. Oh, dear me. I haven't had so much trouble 
delivering a package since the incident in Vienna. And this week we heard from winner of our issue number three contest, Andrew Lindstrom. He writes, hey guys, I really appreciated hearing the recaps of each issue in detail. I've been a listener of the IndieCast for over two years now, and I was really pleased to hear a brand new segment with some yet unmined material. And you really caught my attention. You gentlemen are helping tide all of us over until Indy 5, whenever that may be. The segment sounds great, too. Thanks for your hard work. Andrew from Las Vegas. Hey, thanks, Andrew. We appreciate it. And have a lot of fun with that book. Yeah, enjoy issue number three. I know we did. (laughs) And if anybody else has any comments or thoughts about any future Further Adventure segment, or issue, please send them to thefurtheradventures at gmail.com and don't forget to check our Facebook page, The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Okay, that's it for the day then. We've got a great segment coming up the next time with another guest in Club Obi-Wan. Yes, uh, a, a, wait, is that pie on his face? Might be. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll just have to ask him next time. It's definitely somebody that's made a cameo in the book. Uh, actually, a couple of cameos in the book <laughs> yes. as well, so... Uh, that should be enough of a hint to uh, give everybody an idea as to who we're going to be talking to the next time on the further adventures of Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones.